This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. All right, well, it's great to see you all here. And uh, just again, we encourage you to come over to the reception. Uh, Nancy Sandoval always gets fantastic food and, and wine and beer. And so please join us. We, we would really like that. And if you haven't been to White Tea, too, it's a beautiful building. So uh, I'm really pleased to, today to be able to announce uh, the presence of Gavin Kahn here. Gavin is the third of our GSEF Distinguished Lecturers. So as I mentioned last time, uh, we pick a number of our principal investigators each year, and they will come, and they'll visit us, and they'll also go visit our sponsors. And uh, anyway, so uh, we're really delighted to be doing this. So uh, uh, Gavin Conagher is a, a PI on two GSEF projects. One is on nanostructured silicon-based tandem solar cells. And he has a second new project on uh, hot carrier solar cells. And I think we'll get to hear about both of those today. Uh, Dr. Conagher received his PhD from Southampton University in the UK in semiconductor physics for tandem solar cells in 1995. Uh, he also holds a bachelor's and in material science and a master's in polymer science from London University. He joined the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia in August uh, in, uh, in 2002 and was appointed to be deputy director of the Photovoltaic Center of Excellence in charge of third generation photovoltaic strand. So welcome to uh, Dr. Kelly. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sally, for that very kind introduction. And um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here and a great honour to uh, address this Wood Seminar. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to do that. And I've had a very interesting day today, today as well, looking around Stanford and learning about lots of the different work that's going on on, on photovoltaics and solar energy. OK, so uh, my talk this afternoon is on third-generation photovoltaics, and I'll go through and describe in more detail what I mean by that. <clears throat> But before I do that, I wanted to say that, uh, uh, mention some of our sponsors. We're actually, most, much of our funding comes from the Australian Research Council. Um, and here this, they support the Photovoltaic Centre of Excellence. Uh, and of course also, as Sally mentioned, uh, uh, the Global Climate and Energy Project are providing uh, funding for two of the projects uh, that we're working on. Uh, but we also have uh, a significant project with Toyota Central Re Research Laboratories as well. Okay, so just before I give an outline of my talk and give more detail of, um, on third generation photovoltaics, I just want to put the, uh, the whole subject in context a little bit and talk about um, uh, the application of renewable energy or the use of renewable energies to try and offset uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So the, with the International Panel for Climate Change target of a 60% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, widely thought to be uh, uh, necessary to limit uh, uh, temperature increases to about 2 degrees, uh, we need to have a very significant transfer to uh, renewable energies, or so to uh, move away from fossil fuel energies anyway. So this is a... Um, uh, scenario uh, 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 come up with by the German Advisory Council on climate change uh, as to how we need to transfer into uh, renewable energies. And so these technologies at the top here, the light coloured ones in general, are the renewable energies. Uh, and this is out to 2050 from now somewhere between, well, about here, I suppose. So we can see here that the renewables, particularly solar, the yellow ones, are almost non-existent. But we have to uh, span out to be a much larger fraction uh, in incorporating renewables and in particular solar. Uh, and then this is perhaps the scenario right out to 2100, so an even greater incorporation. So, OK, it remains to be seen whether we can do that. But this is the sort of background that we're up against. Uh, and now my second graph here is on uh, the, another important aspect of a transition to renewable energies. And I must apologise, these are Australian data here, uh, not world data or US data, but the, the same general picture is true. So this is a rough mix of the energy uh, generation mix in Australia. Uh, split between fossil, well, mostly on fossil fuels down here and natural gas here, with a small amount of renewable on top. In Australia, it's mostly hydro. But if we transit to a 60% um, reduction by 2050, if we do that early on, uh, then we have uh, what, what turns out to be a relatively small uh, amount of renewables required. Or, well, uh, 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 but if it's left much later, so late action, we need a much greater transition to renewables. So there's a much bigger fraction here of renewables in, this, in the late scenario than the early scenario. So in other words, not only do we have to change to a renewable energy-based uh, economy, but also it has to be done sooner rather than later. So that means within the next 10 years. Or we have to make significant inroads on that within the next 10 years. Okay. So that's trying to set the scene a little bit. So 
I'm now going to move on to, well, what role do photovoltaics play in this, uh, this transi uh, transition to uh, renewables? And then move on to talk about various generations of photovoltaics. And I'll say what I mean about that. But we, we've identified three different generations. There may be a fourth one to come later, but at the moment we're working with three. <coughs> then, uh, to put that in context, I'll talk about the main losses in a solar cell and, and what uh, third generation uh, approaches can do to try and recoup some of those losses. <coughs> Uh, um, particular ones, and they're the ones that we're focusing on in our GSAT projects. Uh, the first of those is silicon nanostructure tandem cells, uh, and I'll say some more about those. Uh, in particular, the idea there is to engineer the band gap of a material, uh, um, uh, a silicon-based material, well, mainly silicon, but I'll say some other possibilities, through using quantum confinement. So we're using quantum dots or quantum wells to try and engineer a, a wider band gap in a material. And I'll talk about fabrication of materials and devices. The other main project is on hot carrier solar cells, and I'll explain what those are, but the, the basic idea is to uh, capture carriers before they lose their energy to the lattice. Normally carriers lose all their excess energy to the lattice in the form of heat, um, and we're looking at ways to prevent that. I'll talk about the need for energy filtering contacts on such devices, and also um, talk about the uh, slowing down carrier cooling in materials. And there we're interested in the interaction with phonons, lattice vibrations, uh, quantized lattice vibrations or phonons. Um, and then I'll summarize. OK, so um, the first point is that at the, at the moment, photovoltaics in the world is booming. It's a very boom, it's a booming industry. It has been for the last, uh, approximately the last decade. Uh, and this is a graph showing the increase in photovoltaic manufacturing capacity uh, um, uh, cumulative manufacturing capacity, but actually that actually rep represents the amount of installed capacity as well because uh, demand is outstripping supply at the moment. And so we can see a very large increase in, this is the total figure at the back, over the last 10 years, approximately a 30% increase per year up to last year, and then all of a sudden it leapt up about more than 60% uh, uh, in 2007. Uh, it's broken down here in by region, but the one to look, look at is this light blue one at the back here, and that suddenly shoots up uh, last year, and that's mainly through uh, uh, the, the large amount of increased manufacture in China, uh, but also in South Korea uh, uh, um, and Taiwan as well, but, uh, but mainly in China. Uh, the other countries on here, Japan is here with the purple ones. That's been increasing steadily and more or less leveled off behind there. And then here, this is Europe here, uh, with very large increases over the last several years. And at the front, we have the US. Uh, the, um, the, the increase was steady up until the last year when, well, one, 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 one country, whereas the other ones are several countries, so it's not too bad. Uh, but the point is that here there's a 50% increase uh, in 2007, so that's a very significant increase at that point, and uh, almost the same as the, uh, to over the overall total. So these are driven... Uh, um, primarily by market mechanisms, uh, uh, well, rebate tariffs, essentially, me mechanisms to try and increase the um, uh, installation. So they're artificial in one sense. Uh, well, they're artificial in every sense, really. But uh, they're, they're mechanisms to try and increase the in 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 uh, infiltration of pho uh, photovoltaics in the marketplace. Now, the, the types of mechanisms vary, though, from country to country or region to region. Uh, in, J in Japan, they typically been uh, rebate tariffs where you're trying to reduce the amount of or reduce the cost on the, a householder in installing a system. And that's worked very well. And one of the interesting things there is it's tended to hold up. Uh, so it's sort of shown that, that it's been reducing over the last few years, but still the same, the uh, amount of manufacture and the amount of installation is still holding up reasonably well. In Europe, the mechanism is different. There, the mechanism is primarily through a feed-in tariff where um, the householder with a photovoltaic system on, on their roof uh, sells back electricity to the utility at a much greater rate than they buy electricity. So it's a, it's a good incentive to uh, amortise the loan that you get for buying your um, uh, uh, solar cells over a long period and so pay, make the thing pay for itself. In the US, the model is rather different there. Usually, I think, uh, the, the mechanism is the, a power purchase agreement where the system on, on the roof of a, a commercial building or indeed on, on an individual house, I think it can work for those as well, isn't owned by the householder or by the company, it's owned by another company. But the company uh, organises or has agreed to buy back the power for a certain period. And so offsetting their fuel costs uh, or uh, electricity costs for a number of years and also importantly locking it into a particular price. Uh, 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 whereas the manufacturer or the supplier provide, uh, gets money for that which they can use to pay off their loan on the system as well. And that seems to be working very well. Um, okay, so this puts the um, photovoltaics in the context of other renewables, uh, or actually other non-fossil fuel 
uh, um, generation methods. Uh, at the back, uh, there's solar thermal, or for mainly solar water heating, but also uh, solar space heating as well. These, this blue one here is wind. Um, this is nuclear, the red one here, and photovoltaics at the front. So photovoltaics is definitely um, at the renewables, it's the lower, at the lower end, but it's actually increasing much faster. The solar thermal and, and wind are also increasing quite significantly, but uh, solar is increasing at a greater rate, but from, from a smaller base. But very importantly, I was, should have said this is new installed capacity instantly. Very significantly, uh, in 2006, for the first time, new photovoltaic capacity outstripped new nuclear capacity. So that was quite a significant year. I'm afraid I haven't got the figures for last year on this, but it would be interesting to know whether they, uh, that trend is continuing. But I suspect it is. Um, and uh, down the bottom here, uh, uh, this is a local one just, uh, just down the road of the Google Compass, um, uh, a, very, very, a very large photovoltaic system. Okay. Oh. Now, uh, these market mechanisms are ways to increase the amount of insulation, but do they really um, kickstart the market? Uh, the, the important thing is whether they can actually um, create such a market that uh, the, the, the system becomes self-sustaining in the long term. Uh, and for that to be true, you have to have a reduction in cost of the technology as the uh, amount of insulation increases. Uh, so uh, a learning curve in um, uh, uh, how much per unit uh, uh, of the electricity costs are as you reduce the, or sorry, as you increase the amount of installed capacity is very important. And this is a plot of the learning curves for, for three different technologies, very, very different technologies, gas turbines down the bottom in blue, wind turbines in green, and photovoltaics at the top, but which show quite similar characteristics. So this is um, cumulative installed capacity along the bottom, uh, and um, uh, the cost per kilowatt, so per unit of electricity, uh, well, per unit of power, actually, um, uh, uh, up on the, uh, the, the y-axis. Now, the interesting thing is that the slope of all of these is about the same. For every doubling of uh, installed capacity, there's about a 20% reduction in the cost of per unit of electricity with all of these things. And it's quite interesting they follow the same curve. And they also, these two at least, have a, a knee uh, at a particular point uh, where the easy fruit of um, uh, increasing the amount of uh, 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 the knowledge about the system, the uh, volume production advantages you get, the increasing in yield, increasing in production volumes, etc. All of those things have, uh, have been achieved in the first, well, uh, in the 50s with gas turbines, the uh, 80s with wind turbines, and then you get to a point where it's more difficult to get any more incremental increases. But it, it, the, so the slope seems to go through a, a step change where it changes to about 10% there. With photovoltaics, uh, we haven't got to that stage yet. Uh, well, these data are a little bit old, uh, six years old now. But uh, nonetheless, we, we're, we still haven't got to that point yet. It's still, if, if anything, it's actually going below this curve. It's a bit steeper, if anything. Uh, but nonetheless, at some point, we'll reach that, that, that uh, knee. And so then the learning curve will, uh, won't be quite, or the, the leverage won't be quite so effective. This curve here shows the same curve for, the, for photovoltaics. It's tech now I've labeled it as first generation photovoltaics. Here we are thinking about the 85% uh, plus uh, 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 section of the market, which is all on wafer-based um, silicon devices. So there we're, we're talking about melt processing of um, silicon, either monocrystalline or multicrystalline wafers, with a lot of energy going in. Uh, second generation or thin film processes um, are predominantly or all involving non-melt processing, uh, and they involve much less material as well. So they're inherently cheaper. And the interesting thing is that with these 2002 data, we've got approximately the same cost per unit, per unit of electricity, but at about a factor of 10 times less production volume. So it's inherently cheaper. Uh, it's much lower volume production, so it's, it's a, a prediction to say that this should carry on with the same curve. But it does seem to have followed um, a similar sort of line. Possibly it might be a slightly shallower slope, but it's a similar sort of one. And there are many things about um, thin film depositions which suggest that they should... Uh, push this um, learning curve even further uh, into a even higher production volumes and, and lower costs, importantly. But just to ensure that, or to try and ensure that happens, uh, the, the other idea is to transit from a second generation thin film type technology to third generation type technologies. And that's really the main topic, uh, topic of my talk this afternoon. Uh, so what do I mean by those? But if we have this sort of scenario, we've got a lot of potential for driving down the cost even further, down towards... Um, the magic figure of $1 per, per watt. Um, and that's what I want to talk about on this graph here. This is a plot uh, of um, 
the cost for producing a particular a given area, a meter squared of, um, uh, 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 of solar cell material by whatever technology, against the efficiency, the efficiency of turning sunlight into electricity on this axis. So ideally, we want to have a low cost right down here somewhere and a very high efficiency up here somewhere. But if, there tends to be a trade-off between the two. If I now put on the first generation technologies, which I just mentioned on this graph here, uh, they occupy an ellipse somewhere roughly here. Uh, it's actually it's difficult enough to plot this axis with the efficiency, but it's even more difficult to plot this one on, on the cost. But nonetheless, it some, sits somewhere like this. Uh, and I can populate that with um, crystalline silicon solar cells, which sit somewhere like this. Uh, this is wafer-based single crystal uh, um, uh, silicon solar cells, uh, which can be up to 25% efficiency. Uh, but they have a range. But they're also, uh, they can do that by being very high quality, very low defect density, uh, very low impurities, uh, um, so very high quality materials. So the, the defects and hence the reduction in efficiency is quite small. They're actually getting very close to the theoretical limit of 29%. Uh, we can also put multi-crystalline silica, uh, um, silicon cells on here as well. Now, they're slightly less efficient because you've got grain boundaries in the, uh, on the area of the, of the solar cell. They're cut from a multi-crystalline wafer, uh, from a multi-crystalline ingot. Uh, so you have grain boundaries which reduce the efficiency. Uh, but um, nonetheless, uh, uh, but the cost is lower. You, you get a better usage of silicon in, the, in these devices or these cells. Um, uh, so they sit down here somewhere. Now, these are both with melt processed materials, you have to actually melt the silicon uh, before it's actually um, deposited. Um, alternatively, you can have thin film processes which sit down here somewhere, much closer to the axis of the uh, graph. Now, the fact that the ellipse is a lot smaller is illusory because uh, it actually encompasses a much wider range of both technologies and uh, parameter space. But it's only because it's close to the origin that it's, um, it's a smaller ellipse. And there are many more technologies in there, but they all share the, the property that they don't have melt processing. They're all either vapor processing, uh, sorry, vapor phase deposition or solution deposition, um, uh, all of which uh, have lot, much less energy involved in them. So there's less cost involved with the amount of energy embedded into the structure. There's less time involved as well because you don't have to worry about the heating up and cooling down time. And also importantly, there's the very thin layers, so there's less material involved inherently anyway in the, in the structures. So all of those give a lower cost. But uh, because you're not melting the material, you have a higher defect density. There are more impurities, more defects, more grain boundaries, etc., all of which tend to reduce the efficiency. So they come further down on the scale here. Um, so I can put... Now, I've immediately shown that my ellipse isn't actually very accurate by putting the, uh, the currently available ones out here somewhere. They probably haven't quite got down to this ellipse here yet. Uh, um, so they're outside that. And one thing I forgot to mention is that what we're trying to do is get steeper and steeper diagonal lines here. Because these lines here represent the, one of the key metrics in photovoltaics, the cost per watt. The cost per, for, so one solar cell that can produce one watt of electricity in peak sunlight, how much does that cost? And we want to push to ever steeper lines here to reduce the cost per watt. Uh, so at the moment, we're down uh, significantly greater than the $1 per watt level. Although possibly First Solar claimed to be very close to $1 per watt. First solar of um, set up with cadmium telluride deposition uh, and, and expanding very rapidly indeed. Uh, but that's one example of a commercial um, thin film uh, deposition or solar cells. Another example is um, crystalline silicon thin film solar cells in Germany, uh, CSG Solar. Uh, um, they I must be, I'm not quite sure where they fit on there, but they're around about the um, eight or nine percent efficiency. Okay, so. Do we have a, it, it seems as there's a problem. Either we have lower effic uh, high efficiency or we have low cost. Can we get both? Uh, and the idea of third generation is to do that, to get the best of both worlds and to somehow leap across uh, up, whoops, leap up here and uh, have an ellipse up in this region here. Uh, now, this seems to be an oxymoron. It, it, it should be impossible to do because um, uh, uh, how can we actually exploit or, or get a much higher efficiency but still have low costs? Uh, well, the main reason for that is that, if you notice, there's a, a, a very light blue line here as well, th thick but light blue line, which represents the limit uh, for a single material or single uh, band gaps uh, material um, at 31 percent, theoretically, uh, under one sun conditions. Uh, now, the idea of third generation is somehow to jump over that. And the reason that can be done is that um, third generation approaches use either multiple materials or multiple energy levels in the, in the solar cell uh, uh, makeup of the, of the design. Uh, 
And so if they do that, they can exploit the, uh, uh, much higher efficiencies and get much closer to this line up here. This is the limit for um, uh, an infinite number of energy levels. And there are two because it, it, it makes a difference whether it's concentrated or not. Uh, so the idea of third generation is to somehow push up there. And now my, on my next slide, I'll be talking about what these losses are and how we can um, uh, possibly attract, uh, um, uh, tackle those to increase the efficiencies. Uh, but just before I do that, I'll just put uh, another one on here as well, because the third generation devices that are currently exist uh, and um, give very high efficiencies are uh, three, five multi-junction tandem cells, uh, which actually have efficiencies up to 41%. Uh, the, the Sandia labs have, have that record efficiency at the moment. Um, uh, but with, a, with growth processes which are very expensive, they use metal organic vapor phase epi, uh, epitaxy, uh, and materials which are very expensive as well. They have to be very high quality, very low defect density, uh, single crystal um, structures which are monolithic. They're grown uh, um, in, uh, with a single crystal all the way up with a lattice matching. Uh, lattice parameter matching as well. So they're very expensive to make. So, in fact, they probably ought to be over here somewhere, but by this door probably on this graph. Uh, but they, it wouldn't fit on my graph. But, but there's a saving grace in that if we use concentration with these devices, then they can come back, maybe not to here, it might be even further. It's very difficult to tell exactly where it will come, but they'll come back somewhere this way. So the idea here is you have a large concentrating dish, well, a concentrating dish, which focuses a relatively large area of sunlight onto a very small uh, solar cell. So that solar cell can be very expensive, but because it's, a, it's only a very small part of the system, uh, the overall cost uh, for the system is, is relatively small. So that's, that's the great hope with um, three, five tandems. Uh, or indeed other uh, very expensive um, uh, solar cells. Th there are problems with that, but uh, it's, it's uh, certainly one of the main approaches uh, at present. Um, oh, yes, sorry. Amorphous silicon tandems are another area. Now, these are also tandem cells, and I'll explain in more detail what I mean by a tandem cell as I go through. But um, these use amorphous silicon materials, uh, and they're, so they're inherently thin film. Uh, well, they are thin film. Um, uh, but they're very much in the thin film region, so they're right down here somewhere. They boost efficiency of thin film devices, but they're still um, in, in the not particularly high efficiencies. In the lab, they get up to 15% efficiency. Uh, so that's from the other end of the spectrum. Okay, so what are the main, local, main loss mechanisms in the solar cell which we're hoping to tackle with third generation approaches? Well, this is a schematic of, uh, uh, of a solar cell, a very widely used um, uh, uh, representation. It's showing the band structure of the solar cell. So this is the energy axis up here, uh, and this represents the band gap of the material. So within this region of energy, uh, we, we, no electrons can exist, uh, they can't have those energies, and we can't absorb any photons in that region either. Uh, but it's an important property of a semiconductor. What this is supposed to show is the polychromatic illumination from the sun, so a wide range of energies, of course. Uh, and um, this device absorbs photons and generates electrons and holes uh, and creates an electric current. Now, there are two main loss mechanisms associated with this. First of all, because we've got a certain band gap in the material, some of the photons, the infrared photons in the device or in the spectrum, aren't absorbed at all. They pass straight through and don't contribute to the, the, the current. So that's quite a large number of the photons in the solar spectrum, although because they're relatively low energy, it doesn't, uh, it's, it's not quite as large a fraction of the energy. Uh, so that's one loss that we want to try and tackle. The other loss is that for photons that are above the band gap, they create, they generate an exciting electron above the band gap, uh, but it can be for a, high, for a very short wavelength blue photon, uh, the energy could be right up here somewhere, but then in a very short space of time, that energy is lost uh, to lattice vibrations in the material because all these energy levels in between are allowed, so it can hop down, like stepping down a ladder, all these different energy levels and lose its energy as heat uh, in the material. Uh, so that's the other loss we want to try and tackle, the so-called thermalization loss. Uh, and that, between them, those two losses account for about 50% of the losses of solar cells. Uh, there are uh, many other losses in solar cells, and uh, I'm not going to be talking about these in any more detail, but just to mention them, there's a junction loss. This, the junction is put in here uh, essentially to give you electrons out one side and holes out the other. Uh, it's just a way of filtering uh, electrons in one direction and holes the other, so that you get a, um, uh, an asymmetry in the device and you get a current. From the, uh, from the solar cell. That can be, at least in principle, can be reduced to arbitrarily small levels. Well, probably a few tenths of uh, an electron volt. Um, the second loss is contact resistance. Again, that can be made arbitrarily small. 
Uh, and the third one is that if, if you excite electrons across the band gap by absorbing a photon, they can also uh, recombine to emit a photon. This is how LEDs work, uh, by emission of, of light. And so we can't stop that one. We have to allow that to occur. But in terms of um, uh, collecting electricity from the device, it's a loss. It's, it's, or it's, it's an energy we can't harness, or not directly anyway. So, but anyway, I've got to take those away again because they're not the ones we're interested in with, um, for, uh, with third generation approaches. Uh, and I'll just put up these numbers here to show that, um, to put the thing in context, uh, if you have um, a single material, a single PN junction, you can get up to 31% with one sun or even 41% with maximum concentration. But if you have many, many different energy levels, you can get up to 68% or the equivalent number is 87% with uh, maximum concentration. So in other words, there's more than a factor of two times a uh, uh, gain that could be made if we move to, if we can somehow, <coughs> if we can somehow get round these uh, two principal energy losses. So even if we have a, a third generation device made by thin film methods, so it's, it's cheap, uh, but which doesn't work very well, We've still got a lot of scope in, in order to increase the efficiency uh, um, with a, an imperfect device to still get a, a boost in, our, in a efficiency from the device, but nonetheless get steeper on that um, uh, cost per watt curve and so get to lower, lower dollars per watt. So that's a general idea with third generation. So what are the me various mechanisms or various methods by which we can uh, um, incorporate uh, these, uh, 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 tackle these losses? Um, there are many different uh, approaches that have been suggested. They tend to fall into three different categories. Uh, but I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up. Uh, these are the, uh, um, the various efficiencies you can get from all these different types of um, approach. But I'm just going to talk about a few of them, uh, just to give some representative ones. I've already mentioned before the, uh, the efficiency you can get from a single band gap solar cell, uh, 31%. This is the maximum possible efficiency if everything works perfectly. Uh, so that's, that's the, 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 the ground, the, the uh, base, if you like, which we're starting from. Uh, I've also mentioned uh, tandem cells. Uh, now, tandem cells can come in uh, several different levels. You can either have two cells with different band gaps, with ideal optimised band gaps, three, uh, four, five, or um, six up here, and each time you add an extra cell to it, the limiting efficiency increases a little bit, from 40, 44% to 50 uh, lost it, 49% to 58% with six. And if you go up to lots or an infinite number, uh, you can get right up to 68% in principle. So the point is that you in by increasing the number of levels, you increase the efficiency, the limiting efficiency, uh, but you also increase the complex complexity. And as you increase layers, your increase in efficiency decreases. You get diminishing returns from increasing the number of layers. Uh, but that's, um, oh, I did say I'd say what a t t tandem cell is, but you're stacking these different layers of material on, on top of each other. So when the light comes in here, the first one is sensitive to blue light, in uh, this particular case. The, the second one is sensitive to green light, and the third one in this case is sensitive to red. So that's the general, general principle of tandem cells. Okay, another approach is to uh, look down here at down converters. Um, now, down converters take a high energy photon that's shining onto the solar cell and split it into more than one uh, low energy photon, each of which can be absorbed by the, the, the solar cell. So the idea here is to try and boost the current from the device and tackle that thermalization loss that I mentioned. So there are a few different schemes. One of the most successful uh, is the multiple exciton generation or MEG uh, uh, approach that um, is being tackled by Arthur Nozick at, um, at NREL and Victor Klimov at uh, University of California, um, Santa Barbara, I think. Um, uh, so the idea here is that you, it's, it's, this effect, it's an impact called, uh, effect called impact ionisation where you get many different carriers generated by one high energy photon, which occurs in any semiconductor or all semiconductors. But in quantum dots, it seems to be enhanced quite dramatically. So in fact, they can actually get up to seven um, electron hole pairs from one uh, instant photon if it has a high enough energy. Uh, there are problems about how those carriers are going to be collected, but nonetheless, it's a very promising approach. Uh, and actually, the physics behind it aren't really properly understood yet, but it's very interesting. I'm not going to be saying any more than that about it uh, today, but I just thought I'd give a, uh, an idea of what's involved with those things. Uh, the other approach is to, um, it's a very much the partner of, the, of down conversion, really, is to, instead of taking high energy photons and giving multiple um, uh, electron hole pairs, you take low energy photons and combine two or more of them together to give one uh, electron hole pair above the band gap. 
So this is the idea of up conversion. Uh, and um, things like impurity photovoltaics and impurity band photovoltaics are very similar. They all have this property that you've got some intermediate level in the middle of the band gap or, or somewhere in the band gap, which allows a, it's a step ladder for photons to be absorbed across that energy level and then up to that one. So low energy photons can be absorbed in a two-step process to create um, uh, electrons at a higher energy level uh, uh, and they contribute to current in the cell. So that's a way of increasing the current by absorbing those long wavelength photons, the infrared ones. Um, again, I won't be saying any more about those. There's a group of techniques uh, um, which all revolve around um, using the thermal properties of uh, um, materials. Uh, here, with the idea is that we're heating up some sort of extra absorbent material, and then that extra absorbent material is illuminating uh, the solar cell, either by uh, emission or by some other mechanism. So that you heat this thing up to some intermediate temperature between the temperature of the sun and your solar cell, and then that illuminates um, your solar cell material, and, and you get current out that way. So thermophotovoltaics thermo is an example of this. Now, that works, or rather, in principle, can give, give up quite high efficiencies, up to 54%. But there are many different in-series elements involved in this thing, each of which is less than 100%. So you're multiplying um, uh, by sub-100% numbers several times, so the overall efficiency tends to be low at present. But they're, nonetheless, they're interesting approaches. But the one I am going to say a little bit more about is hot carrier cells. Uh, now, they're a ver version of um, uh, thermal, uh, a thermal approach, but here, rather than letting the whole material get hot, we're just letting the, or trying to keep the carriers at a high temperature. Uh, and I'll say more about that as I go through. Um, OK, but I want to start with tandems. So that's the, the first one. So now I'll move on to one of our two projects. Uh, um, this is a, a GSET project with, which has now been running for uh, two, two and a half years um, uh, on silicon-based tandem cells. So here we're trying to make uh, a tandem cell using materials which are based essentially on silicon or, or, or close analogs of silicon. Uh, so the idea of using silicon here is because silicon is a very robust material. It's got a very uh, thousands of years, uh, person years experience in, uh, in the properties of silicon. It's a very robust material, very um, uh, versatile, very um, uh, re readily abundant and relatively easy to uh, purify as well. Uh, and it's quite good for solar cells because its band gap is not ideal, but it's actually quite close. Well, what this graph on the right here shows is um, the, if you use silicon, these green bars, for, for a, a, first of all, a single solar cell, you can get up to, in principle, 29%. Whereas if you had a free parameter on the choice of um, the material you used, you could get up to 33%. Uh, some, so equivalent numbers to what 31% I had earlier. If you, could, you could also use silicon as a bottom cell in a tandem solar cell, so with one other cell on top of it. If you did that, you're up to a possible 42.5% efficiency under ideal conditions uh, as compared to 45%, so the gap is even closer. So, and the similar story is true if you go up to a three-level tandem cell, solar cell with silicon at the bottom, another material in the middle, and a third material on top. Here, the gap is only 3% as well. So silicon actually seems to be quite good as a bottom cell in, in tandem solar cells, uh, which is a good thing. Um, OK, so how are we intended to make these things? Uh, again, the schematic of a, solar, of a tandem cell showing the different layers of material absorbing different fractions of the solar spectrum. Um, we're aiming to do that to make these uh, materials which have a sensitivity to larger um, band gaps um, at, um, uh, using quantum confinement in nanostructures. Uh, and so uh, the idea here is that we're going to use quantum wells or quantum dots uh, that's these, uh, these regions here, to engineer a wider band gap, a, a higher energy level, through quantum confinement. In the very small nanostructures, we get an increase in the energy level due to um, uh, minimization of the uh, spatial volume available to the, uh, to the materials, uh, and you get a, effectively get an increase in the band gap, as denoted by these green lines here. Uh, the idea then is to make a material such as this, which effectively will be a wider band gap semiconductor from which we can make a solar cell, uh, and then once we've made that solar cell, we can sack it on top of another material, such as a silicon solar cell, to make a tandem solar cell. So that's the general approach. The method we use to do that is we start off by depositing uh, by thin film methods, um, either uh, chemical vapor deposition or, or using sputtering, um, thin layers of material. So we start off with a thin layer of silicon oxide, reasonably stoichiometric, 
And then we alternate that with a thin layer of silicon rich oxide. So we've got excess silicon in these layers. And we do that in a multi layer structure up to, up to 100 layers in some cases. Then, when that material is annealed at um, a temperature, 1100 is a typical temperature we use, uh, we get the excess silicon precipitating out from, those, uh, um, uh, from that silicon rich material to form nanocrystals. Uh, and uh, the, because these layers are, are quite thin, at um, less than 10 nanometers and down to 2 nanometers in thickness, the size of these nanocrystals is limited to the layer thickness. Uh, and what we tend to find, if we get the annealing conditions right, is that they, also, they all grow up to that size, and so we get a fairly monodispersed um, uh, size of nanocrystals. Uh, so they have a fairly uniform diameter. What we also find is that the, these are all crystalline, they're all single crystals in the, here, but they tend to be randomly oriented. There's no, there's no information, no epitaxial information between, between these nanocrystals. But they are spaced evenly in, in rows because of, we're growing in these, in these layers, but there's no arrangement in, within the layer. Okay, so that's our main mechanism for doing that. Um, and we've done that with a number of materials. Um, I'm actually going to skip through this a little bit. But oh, I'll just say a little bit about this graph. This is a graph showing how the energy level, uh, as measured by luminescence, varies uh, as you decrease the size of the quantum dots. And we do see an increase in the uh, band gap energy as you, uh, oh, sorry, the, the, the photoluminescence energy, as you decrease the size. In, in raw or less in line with calculation, but it's actually, uh, it rises steeper than that. And it seems to be that the, not only is, it, is quantum confinement at work, also the, the matrix in which these things are embedded is quite important. In fact, it turns out to be the polarity of the bonds on the surface, whether it's uh, bonds with nitride or with oxide in this case, that determines, uh, is a very large, important factor in determining what the energy level of these bonds is. Uh, um, we've done some modeling work on this which corroborates this data very well. Uh, this is a TEM image showing, it's very difficult to see, but you do actually see lattice planes in these ones. This one is probably one of the ones that's easiest to see. Oh, this one's down here is quite good as well. I've got these white circles around here just to uh, highlight the things, but the, re the, the fact that the, the contrast is bad is, isn't because they aren't there, it's because we're talking about silicon in a silicon carbide in this case, so one of the matrix elements is also silicon, so you get the, the electron contrast is quite small between them, but nonetheless we do have those nanocrystals in place. This is an example of some of the modelling work. We are doing ab initio calculations using quantum mechanical uh, inputs uh, of the um, energy levels of these structures. Uh, and this particular example has these light blue silicon atoms in the middle, surrounded by two layers of silicon oxide in this case. Uh, and then we have just hydrogen atoms on the surface. And when you do the calculation, you end up with a, a, a prediction of a band gap of, um, uh, between the two, uh, two energy levels of, what's that, about three and a half electron volts. So uh, this is for a, a quantum dot, which is about one nan nanometer in diameter. So, uh, and we can, we've done a whole range of calculations. So we've just got to the point now where we can go up in size in modeling of these nanocrystals uh, and down in size in making the things, and they do actually meet up. We weren't sure if that's going to happen, but, well, luckily they did. Uh, well, perhaps it's not luckily, but uh, we, we do find that they match up, which is very nice. Uh, we were very glad that happened. <clears throat> we thought we were going to have to have a, a fiddle factor in there, but luckily we don't need one. Uh, and this is an example of um, extending the technology to some other materials, in this case, tin. We have a much better electron contrast between tin, quantum dots, and the matrix. Uh, uh, and uh, tin seems to work quite nicely, and we're just moving on to germanium as well now. This graph here shows uh, the spatial arrangement. This is a plan view image. It shows the spatial arrangement of some of the quantum dots in, in, the, um, in a layer. Okay, so we've done a number of different materials uh, in different matrices, uh, oxide, nitride, and carbide. Um, <clears throat> and the advantage of doing that is that as you go from uh, a, a very good insulator to a moderate insulator to a semiconductor, you get an increase in transmission or, or conductivity between the quantum dots. So we get an increase in conductivity of the overall material. That's very important for uh, the final solar cell. Um, and also, as we go from silicon to germanium to tin, uh, we get a decrease in the processing temperature because the melting point is decreasing and so therefore the temperature at which crystallization occurs decreases. So that's very important both from the energy uh, embedded in the, in, the, in the final product and also um, to make it more compatible with underlying layers. <coughs> uh, so um, uh, tin, of course, is normally thought to be a metal. It actually has two forms a metallic and a semiconducting one with a very narrow band gap. The form we tend to get is a beta form, which is a metallic form, which is a pity. But nonetheless, even with metal nanoparticles, you should be able to open up a band gap, band, band gap if they're small enough. 
because after all, an individual metal atom has discrete energy levels. But we haven't quite got to that point yet, so, which is why we're looking at germanium as well. Uh, these are just the, the stages we've got to with the various different types of uh, growth and characterization. These are examples of some, or, or schematics of some devices we've made with these things. One of the problems is we uh, have to decide what substrate to grow on. We've got quite a few samples now where we've grown on silicon substrate, and they give photovoltaic properties. Um, the problem is that we can't be certain that we're not getting significant absorption in the silicon, uh, and so what we're measuring might be the properties of the silicon with some nanostructure material on top. So we're trying to move on to foreign substrates or substrates which don't involve silicon, which have wide band gaps, either silicon carbide or ideally on a, a quartz uh, substrate. And so that's what we're moving on to now. Uh, but one example of one of the cells that we have got which gives a, a, a good result is uh, on a silicon substrate, but we have a, a silicon nitride barrier layer here which should uh, um, prevent carriers uh, tra being transmitted across from that region there. So when we, with this device here, we have a layer of material which is doped um, with um, uh, antimony, no, sorry, bor uh, boron in this layer, um, and uh, then another layer of n-type material up here which is doped with antimony. And um, from this structure, we can actually measure a photovoltaic response with a voltage of about 83 millivolts, which isn't very big, but it is significant in that it's much larger than you should be able to get just from a metal contact on the surface, because you can actually get a photovoltaic response from that. But this is larger than you would get from that. So we're fairly confident that this is actually um, from the nanostructure itself. OK, uh, I'm aware that I'm um, eating into the time. But um, this is the, uh, the second major topic I wanted to talk about, and I'll go through it uh, relatively quickly. Hot carrier solar cells. So this is a subject of uh, a second GSAT project that we have, which is starting just now, uh, essentially. Um, hot carrier solar cells were, the theory was um, first suggested in 1982 by Ross and Nozick, and then developed further by Peter Werfel and Martin Green in the uh, 90s. Uh, and then... <clears throat> Uh, we've done a little bit more work on it recently, just at the end of last year, just coming out this year in uh, solar energy materials and solar cells. The idea is to absorb a whole range of photon energies in an absorbed material, as, as does any other solar cell. Uh, and that creates a whole range of different energies, so different electron energies up here and whole energies down here. The idea, though, of the hot carrier solos, solar cell, though, is to extract those carriers before they can thermalise. If we can do that, a big if, but if we can, then uh, the voltage for that device should be significantly higher. There's a second requirement, though. Uh, when we um, extract energy, we have to have very specific contacts on this thing. They have to have a very narrow energy range. They have to be energy filtering contacts. And the reason for that is that um, the, uh, um, if we didn't have that, then the cold, contacts, the cold carriers in the contact here would cool down the hot carriers here. We'd lose quite a lot of any extra energy by those, contact, those carriers here going over into, onto the, into the contact material. And what we'd end up with, effectively, is a thermoelectric cell a rather expensive thermoelectric cell. So uh, we, we, that's why we need to have a narrow range of contacts here. So we've got two big problems. We need to slow down the rate of carrier cooling in this absorbed material, and we need to have a narrow range of contacts. So the first problem is, the, sorry, the, the contact one is a relatively easy one because we can, <coughs> we've, well, we've made some experimental progress on this, and energy filtering is something that uh, there's a lot of knowledge on in, in general. And we're trying to um, essentially do what other people have done, uh, but with a thin film type of deposition technique. We're trying to get some sort of energy filter like this, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, through a double barrier resonant tunneling structure. Now this has the structure where we have thin layers of oxide surrounding some sort of level which has um, uh, uh, some discrete energy level in it. And we're using quantum dots for this, using the same sort of technology as I was talking about with the tandem cells. So silicon quantum dots in the level in the middle here. Now, these have the property that they have a very narrow energy level, or at least the ones we're trying to make with this single level one have. And so that we should have a very resonant effect, which is, uh, only occurs at one particular energy. Uh, so that if we plot an IV curve, we should see a big peak at a particular energy where th th this energy level here is very resonant with the uh, applied voltage uh, on this side. And that when you go to higher voltages, that particular conduction path is shut off, so you get this drop here. So this negative differential resistance effect has been well known in quantum well structures for a long time, but we're trying to reproduce it in um, thin film structures. Uh, and this is an, an example of the, the results we've got. We do indeed see this sort of peak in the blue one here and also in the red one, but it's not very strong. Uh, and so we're, we're, but one of the important points about this is it's, it's at room temperature. 
so, uh, which is uh, very important because our, our structures will have to work at room temperature. And so we're working to try and improve this um, uh, material by improving the, uh, the quality of the oxides and also by we're trying to sharpen up the, the peak by having a very narrow dispersion of the um, quantum dot sizes. So that's the, we're, we're moving towards that at the moment. But we hope that sort of structure will be appropriate. Okay, so the second problem, reducing hot carrier cooling. And this is the main topic of the, uh, of the GSEP project. Just before I talk about how we're going to, hoping to reduce it, I'll first of all say, what, what do we mean by carrier cooling? Or, or what, what, what are the mechanisms for co cooling of carriers? Uh, this is a band structure again, uh, slightly more complicated now, uh, but just showing the particular energies that are allowed in a, in a given semiconductor. This is fairly typical, this sort of structure. So if we absorb a photon, it creates a high energy electron up here and a, a hole down here, which has a reasonable amount of energy. Most of the energy is actually in the electrons, uh, usually in most semiconductors. <coughs> Now, that electron up here cools by interacting with the lattice, the lattice atoms. And it does so by uh, actually causing the atoms to move. It's, it's actually causing lattice vibrations or, or phonons. Uh, but it is predominantly with optical phonons, and I'll explain what they are in just a moment. <clears throat> but the important point about them is that they have a very discrete energy, or fairly discrete energy. And so the energy lost is in discrete hops, as it hops down like this. Holes do something similar. They also uh, lose their energy in, in, in small steps, uh, but discrete steps, uh, but there's less energy in there in the first place. Now, these optical phonons, <coughs> uh, as, you, as the carriers cool, you tend to build up an excess population of these optical phonons, uh, and you get this situation, the so-called phonon bottleneck effect, where you've got a, a, a large population of these phonons all vibrating away in the material, uh, and they can then interact back with electrons, uh, if they've got enough of them, and create the reverse reaction which reheats the electrons. So that's the me main mechanism uh, by which we, or in indeed it's been measured, we've, it's been measured that with the, when you get this effect occurring, you get a slowing of carrier cooling. So that's the thing we're trying to exploit. So the critical point is, how do these optical phonons uh, um, here, how do they decay away into heat in the lattice? Heat in the lattice is, uh, is essentially acoustic phonons, uh, they're named because they, they, they carry the sound uh, in, in materials, but they also carry the heat. They're, they're, they're the mechanism by which heat is dissipated throughout the material with a large increase in entropy to give you the, um, the overall heating of the material. So that's what we're, we're trying to interrupt this particular mechanism. Hmm. Oh, that's a pity. Um. Oh, that's a pity. That was supposed to show, uh, it's supposed to show a um, schematic of uh, phonon vibrating. But, uh, oh, there it goes. Uh, well, that's the, the second one, actually. Oh, I was looking at my screen. Sorry. I... That's why it didn't work. Okay, so this is supposed to simulate an optical phonon oscillating. Uh, the point about it is that it's, it can vibrate very fast, so it has a lot of energy, but it's got no translational momentum. It doesn't move through the material, so it's not transmitting heat. Uh, it's a standing wave, essentially. Uh, so this is predominantly what uh, um, interacts with electrons. So the electrons are scattering with these phonons in the material and not um, scattering the, or spreading the heat. Well, not very much, anyway. Uh, but the, the main mechanism by which that decays is that it excites these bonds next to it and it creates other phonons which oscillate away from or move away from the central phonon. So there are two phonons moving away from the central phonon, and these are acoustic phonons because they move through the material and transmit heat. So that's the main way that this phonon decays. And it's a very uh, specific mechanism, this Clemens mechanism, by which this decays into two phonons with half the energy. So that's what we're trying to interrupt. And so in order to uh, uh, illustrate that a bit further, we have to look at the allowed modes of phonons uh, in materials. This is an element, um, uh, element uh, such as silicon, which only has certain specific allowed modes. Um, uh, but it does have an allowed mode at half the energy of the, um, of the optical phonon. So uh, that is allowed. If, on the other hand, we have a compound semiconductor, there's a gap in the allowed phonon modes. So if I plot that uh, phonon on, on now, now it, there aren't any allowed um, uh, modes for this decay to occur. And, in fact, this is indium nitride in this particular case, but slowed carrier cooling has been observed in indium nitride. 
Uh, and also, we've had uh, um, um, extended phonon lifetimes in these materials here. Their general property is that they have a very large difference in their masses between the, uh, the in gallium in this case and nitrogen in, in, in that case. Uh, so that seems to be the general property. However, indium nitride looks to be quite a good material, but indium nitride is actually very difficult to make for exactly the same reason that it has a very different, large difference in masses. It actually doesn't want to form uh, crystals very easily. And it's particularly difficult to make cubic material, which is the one we'd really be interested in. So we're interested in trying to emulate this effect in nanostructures. Um, so this is a schematic of a nanostructure, uh, just a, a quantum well type la la layer of materials, uh, in, in this case with four atoms in each layer, or four atomic layers. Um, and what we've done is we've done some atomic modelling, or so, so, some one-dimensional modelling of this. This is the structure in a, a phonon structure in a bulk material, all the allowed energy levels in that material. If now we impose... <coughs> um, the, uh, a nanostructure on this, uh, again it's in one dimension, so we're thinking about layers of quantum wells. This actually splits up into various, there are various gaps, so various allowed energy levels, but then the gaps in between those energy levels. And then there are other gaps occurring. So when you've got four atoms in here, you end up with four different branches of this thing. Uh, now the important point is that if you can tune that in just such a, just such a way that you hit the en correct energies, you can prevent that uh, phonon from decaying into this point here. So that's, that's what we're aiming to do. And we're moving on from um, uh, doing modelling in one dimension to doing modelling in three dimensions to see what sort of structure you need in three dimensions to achieve this effect. But what it seems to be is it's very similar to photonics. In photonics, you have just this sort of thing occurring as well. When you vary the refractive index in two different materials, you have certain photon energies which aren't allowed to be transmitted. In this case, when we vary the ease with which phonons are transmitted through the material, or the acoustic impedance, then you modulate the allowed phonon energies which are allowed to pass through. And so we're, we're looking into what materials are required to do that and uh, what sort of structures you need in order to, to do that. But we, it seems likely that you need... Um, oh, this is a, um, just a schematic of this occurring. So the reason this occurs is that if we have a... Um, a, qu a quantum well structure like this with different layers of material either side here with the right properties you actually get a reflection from those modes uh, of those modes from those interfaces and so what we end up with is um, we're back to essentially the same situation the, as we had in the first place that because it's reflecting backwards and forwards it's back to being a standing mode so those frequencies aren't being transmitted through the material anymore uh, so that's essentially what we want to end up with we think that in uh, uh, three dimensions, what we probably need is a, a periodic arrangement of quantum dots arranged uh, um, in, in some sort of structure as yet to be determined. Uh, but that's the, um, uh, the main focus of the work. And of course, the important point about that is to work out ways to make these periodic structures by self-assembly type techniques uh, uh, and to move on to that sort of um, structure. So we have something, something like this with um, an arrangement of quantum dots all arranged in a periodic arrangement, probably be hexagonal rather than the square that I've drawn here. Uh, we'd also need the quantum dot structures on the outside um, for the selective energy contacts. Uh, so these are the resonant tunneling contacts that I mentioned before, one on each side. But if we can make those things, big if, but if we can, we have what turns out to be a relatively simple structure. We just have three different structures, um, all of which, uh, uh, for which we can make a, a highly efficient solar cell, if everything works perfectly. But the point being, rather than having the very many different layers uh, that you have to have with a multi-junction structure, this is, conceptually at least, a, a relatively simple structure. Um, OK, so that's uh, be finished, except for the summary. I talked about the large increase in, uh, in photovoltaics and the, uh, ver the relevance of photovoltaics as a means of... Uh, addressing the need to increase or, or move over to renewable energies um, in particular. I talked about the three generation of photovoltaics moving from wafer based through thin film uh, to third generation approaches uh, for tackling uh, losses in, in photovoltaics. Well, I talked about those losses as well, the main ones being below band gap energy losses and also the thermalization energy losses you have from uh, high energy photons. Um, and I talked about the various different approaches with third generation, but I focused in particular on silicon nanostructures <clears throat> with the focus on trying band gap engineering to try and uh, engineer a wider band gap in these materials and the fact that you can do it with a wide range of quantum dot materials. <clears throat> uh, and it seems to be a very general effect as well. And the fact that we've made some early devices in these structures.
Uh, and then I talked about uh, hot carrier solar cells with the need for the two main requirements for energy filtering contacts uh, and also for um, uh, reduced carrier cooling by which we hope to enhance uh, phonon bottleneck effects in nanostructure based solar cells. Um, and it seems that third generation approaches where you need to have multiple energy levels seem to lend themselves, or quantum dot nanostructures lend themselves towards third generation approaches. And that's why they keep cropping up again and again. And that's perhaps not that surprising because the big advantage of quantum dot, quantum dot structures, uh, or quanti quantized structures in general, is you have a, a big increase in the range of materials that you can engineer in the material. And so that's why you end up with uh, them being so widely used. Okay, so I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention. Well, so let's take a few questions, oh, oh, please, listen. and then uh, we'll perhaps move over to Y2E2 to continue the question. Oh. How uh, close are you to uh, going to production with any third generation cells, and what kind of price does it look like when you hmm. initially hit on the initial? Um, a long way, I think, is the answer to the first question. And the second one is. Uh, um, well, they're inherently, or the methods we're using to make them are thin film approaches. So I think the price will be relatively low uh, and something similar to third gener generation approaches. The big question is whether we can get the efficiencies that will make leverage those higher, uh, uh, or sorry, lower cost per watt. So that's a big question. But um, I think they will be similar to other thin, thin film solar cells. Yeah. When you showed your bar graph for third generation processes and showed the increasing efficiencies, mm -hmm. Were those incrementally achieved? In other words, when you were up at the tenth item, did you have to do all nine below it? Oh, I see. No, no, no. Um, they're, they're, they're individual efficiencies or limiting efficiencies for each of those approaches. So I could have just put up one of those and it would still have the same efficiency Great, bar. Thank yeah. You, very mm. yeah. With regards to the, uh, the hot barrier cells, the arrays mm -hmm. of quantum dots, how periodic do you think the self control techniques? Uh, Ah, good, very good point, very good point. Uh, w w the answer is we don't know yet, uh, but um, you've raised a very important point that uh, w w part of the modelling is going to be to determine how, how, how big an error we can stand in these structures. Uh, and we don't know yet. Uh, there's a, there's a, one worrying aspect is that it might be, have to be as perfect as photonic structures have to be, and they, they have to be very perfect indeed over many, many hundreds of repeat units. Um, but there are reasons to suppose that we don't have to be quite that good uh, because we're particularly interested in the short wavelength high energy phonons and they tend to be fairly localized. So uh, I think there are reasons to suppose that perhaps we can get away with um, uh, less than 100 repeat units as being have to be perfect, possibly as small as 10 or 20, something like that. So which is a good thing because they'll be difficult to make. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.